folks, um, our guest speaker today um, is a real blessing. We've had him at our men's group. We're very blessed to have him. Let me give you a little bit of background on, uh, on Mr. McGuff. Tom and Lucy are good friends with Pastor Chuck and Cheryl. They are blessed with two adult sons. Um, by the way, the one son followed Tom into the professional. He's a professional player as well. And the other son is a high school principal and has just received his doctorate. Um, as you know, Tom is a former Cleveland Indians pitcher and works for Cornerstone Television Faith and Ch Family Channel. He is host of Hope Today and the Hard Questions program. It's hard to get Tom excited about many things. Actually, quite the opposite is true. Tom loves Jesus, and you will see that. And it's evident as he shares not only his life, but the blessing God has for each of us when we put our trust in Jesus. This is not the first time Tom has been in the Jennerstown Church. He spoke a few years ago to our men's group, and this morning we are pleased to have him back to share on Sunday morning. Folks, would you please welcome Tom McGuff. Thank you, my friend. God bless you. It is such a delight to be with you this morning, and I just have to tell you that uh, yesterday we were blessed. Uh, yesterday was the March for Jesus in Pittsburgh, and God gave us the opportunity to be able to broadcast it live, a live program uh, from 11 to 12 yesterday, and it's actually going to be re-airing today during the church hour. Uh, it was a wonderful opportunity, and we broke some new ground because we were able to do the remote broadcast literally using different people's cell phones. And then they would, by, by way of Skype, they would be bringing their signal into Cornerstone Television. It was just incredible how God was able to bless us. But the reason I mention this to you is because our verse, and there's always a verse, anytime we gather, there is the word of God. Our words return void. What I say today that's of my own words that will return void, but, but everything that is God's word will bring glory. Everything that is God's word will bring a harvest. Everything that is God's word will be true. He is faithful. And our word for this television program yesterday, for the March for Jesus, was a wonderful passage from the book of Romans. And, and our scripture for today, for Pentecost Sunday, is also from the book of Romans, Paul's letter to the church in Rome. But he says to them in this particular chapter, in the 10th chapter, verses 13 and 14, he boldly says, anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Now I want you to help me to thank God for that by saying amen. Amen. Anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. If you know nothing or learn nothing from our time together today, if, if together we go out of this sanctuary with just one piece of wisdom, that's a big piece of wisdom to know that anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. But then he goes on in uh, chapter, or verse 14, and he says, but how can they call upon him when they don't believe? And how can they believe if they've never heard? And how will they hear if we don't tell them? That's the second thing that we need to understand, as we have the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit, and that's what we celebrate today. God has his presence in our lives, and when we go out beyond these sanctuary doors today, we've got to tell someone else about Jesus. We've got to allow them to see the light of his love, the light of his forgiveness, and see that in our lives, and bring glory to our Father who is in heaven. Praise God. So that is kind of my starting point. Now, the, the, I'm going back um, many, many years. This would have been 1984 that Lucy and I, Jude was asking me this morning where we lived, and it's the same place that we lived in 1984, the uh, same home that we, that we moved from Johnstown, that's where I was born and raised, and when we went to Pittsburgh. And so in 1984, in the fall of 1984, I was uh, promoted with the company that I was with at that time, and, and we moved to Pittsburgh, and all we knew was that I would be overseeing a, an operation there in the Pittsburgh area, and so we could pretty much live anywhere that we wanted. Well, we, we went to this beautiful hotel. It was the Marriott uh, Hotel in, in Monroeville, which if you're familiar with that area of Pittsburgh, it's, it's the Monroeville Mall, right where the Monroeville Mall is, and I believe now it's the Doubletree. I believe it's changed ownership, but at that time it was the Marriott Hotel. 
And so Lisi and I go there after church. We, we had our, our last Sunday, if you will, in church that Sunday. And then that evening, we drove from our home, our little townhouse in, in, in Johnstown, came to Pittsburgh, the big city. Oh, and we were excited, and we check into the hotel, a nice young man behind the desk. He said, would you like me to sign you up for the Honored Guest Program, the Marriott Honored Guest Program? And I, I asked what probably most of the men in here would ask. I said, well, does it cost anything? And he said, oh, no. He said, in fact, he said, you'll get credit. He said, every dollar that your company spends here, every night that you and your wife stay here, will go toward accruing these Marriott Honored Guest Points. And I thought, well, great. Boy, that sounds easy enough. Sure, sign me up. Well, I had forgotten about this because we were there in this hotel for probably about two, two and a half months during our time of relocation. And through the graciousness of the company that I was with paying the the bill and through the graciousness of this hotel chain, we had racked up 110,000 Marriott Honored Guest Points. Okay, and so when we moved into our home, and it would have been in November, I believe, uh, 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 October, November, that we actually moved into our home, I remember uh, Lucy coming out one day as I came home from work, and she come, came rushing out, and she, we had this official-looking envelope from the Marriott Corporation, and she wanted to, me to be there that we would open it together. She didn't want to open it herself. And so she, we opened this envelope, and we look, and we get this beautiful letter, and it says, you know, thank you for choosing the Marriott, Motel there, uh, Marriott Hotel there in Monroeville. Uh, and, and it's my pleasure to let you know that you have accrued 110,000 Marriott Honored Guest points. And I thought to myself, unless these things were yen, they're going to be a great value. So now we have a gift catalog, which is right below the, this beautiful letter. And, and it goes in ascending order. The, the lesser expensive gifts in the catalog are at the beginning, and then they get more expensive. So I go right to the end. I go to the back. What's the best you got? I have 110,000 points. What's the best you have? And at the very, very end was the grand prize. You know, it's like, let's make a deal. You know, the grand prize, boy, for the day. And at the very, very end, it talked about a a vacation of a lifetime, essentially. It was seven nights free lodging at a Marriott of her choice anywhere in the world. It was two round-trip airline tickets to anywhere in continental United States. It was seven days free rental of a different rent-a-cars. You could have Hertz or you actually had your choice on that. It was free meals from all of the big chains for that week of your vacation. And so we were so excited and knowing that geographically we wanted to take full advantage of this and get as far away from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania as we possibly could, geographically in continental United States, that point was Southern California. And so we were so excited. We got to go. We planned this trip for the next spring that while, uh, and we just had found out actually in January of that year, that would have been 85, that in January that Lucy was pregnant with our older son, Eric. And so while she was still early in the pregnancy and we would be able to travel, we were going to take full advantage of the generosity of this hotel chain and my company that had paid our way in that hotel. So we had planned this trip about this time of the year. It was in the spring of that year. And we were so excited because we were going to be going to Southern California. And I have to tell you, it was truly a memorable, memorable experience because we got to see and do things that are once-in-a-lifetime things to do. So we had this trip planned, and we got new outfits. And I have to tell you, I'm wearing this sport coat today for a reason. Because this was the sport coat that Lucy bought me at Hill's Department Store. Remember Hill's Department Store? At Hill's Department Store. And and so we were going to be ready for this vacation. And we got to do that week. We got to see and do some extraordinary things. We got to go, of course, see the Pacific Ocean. It was wonderful. We had a chance to walk on the Walk of Fame on Hollywood Boulevard. Oh, my. You know, put our handprints and our footprints into the different prints of the stars and so forth on Hollywood Boulevard. We had a chance to see, speaking of Let's Make a Deal, had a chance to see the taping of several Let's Make a Deal shows. We had a chance to see the Johnny Carson show. And the guest that night was uh, Jimmy Stewart from Indiana, Pennsylvania. And he was the guest on the program that night. And it was just so memorable, all of these different things that we had a chance to do. But 
the most outstanding part of this, and by outstanding, I mean that still is a memory to me, very vivid memory to me, was we got all dolled up and went to Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills. Now, have you ever heard of Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills? It is considered by many to be the richest, most opulent street in the world, the shopping district, and it's extraordinary. As a matter of fact, it is so exclusive that not all of the shops are open to pedestrian traffic. Uh, some, of the, some of the shops are by invitation only. Some of the others, though, are available, and you can just come in off the street to be able to shop in the places. Well, we get dressed up, and literally, I wore my new sport coat from Hills Department Store, white pants, not these, because I believe that, um, I believe that those had flare pants. It would have been back at the time, and so I, I've gotten rid of those, but I keep everything else, believe me. And so we go out to Rodeo Drive, we, we park the, the um, rent-a-car that we had because there every other car is a Mercedes, a Rolls, a Benz, that, you know, it's just extraordinary. And we're walking down Rodeo Drive like we own the place, and we're just having so much fun. Lucy knows that we don't belong there. I know that we don't belong there. I had $50 wham, walk-around money. That was my cash. $50 cash, and here we are going down through the richest shopping district in the world like we own the place. And we're a half step away from a laugh throughout the entire evening. We're having such a good time. We're going into each of those places that they'll allow pedestrians to go into. I remember at one point I froze in front of one of the windows, and it was a, not a clothing store. It was a clothier, and, and I'm looking at a sport coat that was almost $5,000. Five thousand dollars. This is 1985. Five thousand dollars, and I, I just froze. And Lucy said, "Are you okay, honey?" And I said, "Yeah." And she said, "Well, what are we stopping here for?" I said, "Because I want to see what somebody looks like that comes out of that store. That sport coat is five thousand dollars. You could buy a good truck for that, you know." And it was just spectacular. So we're having such a good time. Toward the later part of the evening, we go into an art gallery, and. I don't have to tell you, I would have been out of place at that under normal circumstances. But there's a little narthex area that was open to the public. Then the inner gallery was what was by invitation. But we're in this outer, outer gallery, and as we're looking, and I'm looking at this one particular painting. You've heard the expression that a little education is a dangerous thing. Well, it was very dangerous for me that night because Lucy is just a little bit in front of me. We don't realize that there's anyone around us. And I'm looking at this painting, and I'm, I'm pontificating, and I'm going on and on and on about this artist and the period of his life that he painted this painting and, you know, making a big deal about all of this. Lucy knows that I have no clue as to what I'm talking about. And the only reason I recognized this painting and this individual was because I'd read about him in the airline magazine on the flight out to California. <laughs> so armed with just little bits and pieces of information, you know, it was hysterical. What we didn't realize, neither one of us realized, was that as we're talking and going on and we're having a good time over here, there's a clerk from the gallery that's right behind us. And so when we go over, just motion to go over to the other wall, the clerk is looking at us, us and her eyes are wide open, and she said, sir, if you don't mind a, an observation, it's, it's obvious it's the, 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 what you know about that artist and, and, and the, your articulation and, and, and the way that you and your wife are, are dressed, that you're connoisseurs of the finer things of life. And I said, well, art's my middle name. <laughs> and she says, what I'd like to do, I want to invite you back into our inner gallery. That's where we keep our more expensive paintings. And I'm thinking to myself, these aren't Kmart blue light specials out here. The paintings out in this little narthex were in the range of probably one to $5,000. But now this poor soul takes us back into an inner gallery believing that we are worthy, that we are, should be going back into this, that we have the resources to be able to look at paintings, to purchase a painting that might be 25, 30, 35, 40, 50, thousand dollars. This is 1985 and paintings now fifty, sixty thousand dollars as we go into this room. Well I hadn't lost my sense of humor and I'm looking at this one painting and it was truly beautiful and I said to Lucy as seriously as I could say it, wouldn't that look beautiful in our home? Now she knew like I did that was worth more than our home. 
somehow, some way, and I'm not sure exactly how, somehow, some way, God blessed us to get out of that situation without a, a major embarrassment, and I never had to fess up that I was there with $50 in that inner gallery uh, there on Rodeo Drive. When we came back to Pittsburgh, this had such a profound impact on us this whole week because it was just, it was really something very, very special for us to, to just get away, to, to go into a brand new environment and to be together. We were just like two kids. And, and I remember for at least a week, probably longer, probably 10 days or even to two weeks, every night in my dreams, when we got back to Pittsburgh, I would dream about this vacation that we had on Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills. And inevitably, I would dream specifically about this encounter with this clerk, this exchange in that inner gallery as I was looking at a painting that I knew that I could not afford. Now, you know in your dreams you can fly, you can run like the wind, you know, you can you do all kind of crazy things in your dream. They're your dreams. So you can be the, the game-winning home run hitter, you know, or, or whatever. That's what a dream is. In my dream, inevitably, every single night for at least a week, I would get into that situation that I was in on that, in that art gallery on Rodeo Drive, and I'd be looking at that painting. But now in the dream, you kind of manipulate the truth a little bit, what actually happened. And in my dream, every night, as I would be looking at that painting, Ultimately, it would come to the point where the clerk would ask me the question, do you like what you see? And I would say, yes, I do. It, it's beautiful. And she says, would you like to buy it? Well, now I have to fess up. So now I, I, I have to acknowledge to this clerk that we don't belong here. And I, I, I say to her that we're just, we're, we're from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I've got $50 cash. I don't have anywhere near what that painting costs. And, and we're, we just, we're having a good time here on vacation. And she says, sir, that's not my question. Do you like what you see? Well, yes. Do you want to buy it? Well, okay. And then she says, how much do you have? Now I have to tell her that I have $50 cash. That's all I have. Probably not even a thousandth of what that painting is worth. And I'm surprised because I figured the conversation will end there. But she says to me, she asked me a question I, I barely understand. She says, would you be willing to give it all, all that you do have? And I start to argue with her, ma'am, you don't understand. I'm saying all I have is $50 cash. She says, sir, that's not my question. Would you be willing to give it all? <laughs> well, yeah. And she says, as the owner, of this gallery, I say to you now, sold. Mm. Now that's a pretty weird dream, isn't it? Kind of unusual. And, and it would only happen in a dream. It certainly wouldn't happen in Jennerstown. It wouldn't have happened on Rodeo Drive. It wouldn't happen in Pittsburgh, where someone would give you something of such extraordinary value for such a pittance that we give in return. But that's exactly what God has done for you and me through His Son, Jesus Christ. And I believe the blessing of the, God's Holy Spirit that we celebrate this day is exactly that. That you and I, we look at that painting of what, how God sees us. That's how God sees us. Not how we actually are as a filthy, wretched sinner. God doesn't see us as that prodigal that's gleaning food from the pigs. Have you ever been on a pig farm? Have you ever seen a pig sty? Have you ever seen what they're fed, the entrails of other animals and diseased and filth and garbage and just literally scraps and skins and just unbelievably uh, filthy things? That boy, as he was gleaning food, stealing food from every other, every other pass that, that he would take and feed for the pigs that, that he would take for himself. God doesn't see us that way. But God sees us like the father, that while that boy was a, a distance in the horizon, that, that he goes rushing out 
And it's the father who embraces the boy. It's the father who treats him as the son. It's the father who takes off his robe. It's the father who takes off his ring. It's the father who says, kill the fatted calf. My son who was lost is now found. It is the father who is faithful. Dear God. Dear God. So today in this sanctuary, this is not just another Sunday morning of church, but this is a day that we can say, thank you, God, for your faithfulness. Thank you, dear God, for who you are. Thank you, dear God, for your faithfulness. Thank you, dear God, that as I was feeding food to the pigs and gleaning some of that food, thank you, dear God, that you are faithful. Thank you, dear God, that you believe in me. Thank you, dear God that you've made that provision. And thank you, dear God, that you allow your presence to be in my life. Praise you, dear God. Praise you, dear God. We can't understand that in the carnal. If we think the way the world thinks, we can't comprehend that. Nobody would love me that much. And I, all of the, the opportunities that God blesses me to have to, to share the, the one common thread that I see with those who have yet to receive that precious gift is that they believe the lie of the devil. That they look at that painting, how God sees them. And, and they just can't believe it. You don't understand, God. All I have is 50 bucks. That's all I have. That's not the question. Are you willing to give it all to receive what I have done for you? I've already fought the fight. I've already won the victory. I've already made the provision. And I've already freely given it to you. It's now merely yours to receive. Just to receive it. Just to embrace it. Thank you, dear God. Thank you, dear God. What a powerful, powerful promise he gives to us. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believeth should not perish but have everlasting life. Our March for Jesus verse, anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Thank you, dear God. Thank you, dear God. Thank you, dear God. Thank you, dear God. Mm. As Paul wrote to the church in Rome two chapters earlier, This is what he says to them, and this is our lectionary scripture for today. He says, we know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. Mm, Amen. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. Thank you, dear God. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have. But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Wait here is an action verb. And it says we just don't wait, but we wait. We wait in expectation. We wait believing in faith that the process has already started. Thank you, dear God. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Thank you, dear God. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with his will. Thank you, dear God. I close with a final story. Lucy and I are blessed. You know, you, you remember the expression, uh, kind of an axiom that used to say when, it, when it, you have only lemons, you know, some people are able to make lemonade. Well, God has really blessed us. Uh, Cornerstone Television, we're all about producing, producing television. And so when the pandemic came, it really crimped, like everything else in our culture and in our world, it crimped our ability to be able to produce television ministry. And, and so we had to be creative. 
and, and we had to break new ground. And, and God allowed us to understand and embrace technology, the cell phone. And I was telling you about our March for Jesus yesterday and about how people on their cell phone, the camera on my cell phone is more sophisticated, it's high definition, and it's more sophisticated than the big cumbersome cameras that we have in the studio. It's, it's amazing, the technology that we have. And, and so we were able to continue producing good ministry and, and good television ministry, broadcast ministry, through very, very creative ways. And one of the things that, that we really learned, Lucy and I as a couple, we've always been best friends. And last year when all of the remote productions outside the studio were canceled, God allowed us to discover a talent with Lucy that is extraordinary. And, and God told Lucy and me that he would create a medium within a medium, a one-minute message that we call a power minute. And on our Faith and Family channel, if you're familiar with the Faith and Family channel, after the worship service goes for 58 and a half minutes, at the top of each hour, leading to the top of each hour, we do a power minute. And we do them from iconic locations all over the region, all over the viewing area. So that somebody that maybe wasn't on our channel, as they're flipping through, they see Diamond Square and Ligonier. And then, hey, I, we were married there, you know, and the husband calls the wife in, and they stop because it's this beautiful remote location. But there, I get to tell them a story and share a scripture about God's love, that God has a plan for your life. Tricked you, didn't I? You thought we were going to talk about the square. And, and praise be to God. He developed this medium, and Lucy has become an anointed producer of television. And so we go all about the, the region and all different locations where we can tell a little story and share a little message and a passage of Scripture that become these power minutes. And the power minutes have grown way beyond Cornerstone Television that now other ministries use them as part of their, their social presence, their social media, and so on and so forth. And they've really taken on a life of their own in all of these different mediums. Just recently here now for summer, we have some new messages that we've done with the, the, the blades, the, the uh, windmills that you see in, in Somerset County. We, and, and we were able to get right up underneath one. It was amazing. We had to practically crawl through barbed wire, but we, we got to the point, and, and Lucy is the crack producer. She's just so gifted as how she's able to frame the shots and everything like that. But in closing, I want to share one of our power minutes that we just did. We just did it last week as part of the March for Jesus. We were, it went to town every day, and we were down at the point. And it's always amazed me about the barge traffic. Have you ever seen barges on the river, the, ri the, the river barges there at Three Rivers? It's absolutely incredible. To me, it's, it's hard for me to reconcile in my mind when you see a lead boat, and they're lead, literally, a lead boat that's two-thirds of a football field in length stacked with millions of pounds, literally three, three and a half million pounds of coal. And you see it way up over. And it's like, how in the world does that thing stay afloat? You know, you can picture balsa wood floating on top of the water, but how in the world can that boat do that? And it's actually a principle, I had to do some research on this, it's actually a, a principle of physics called upthrust. Now listen to this and, and see how this applies to our lives. Upthrust means that literally the more weight that is stacked inside that, that football field, the payload, the more weight that's above the water pushing down actually creates an equivalent amount of thrust, an even greater amount of thrust underneath pushing up from the water surface. And it's called upthrust. And for every pound that is added pushing down, there is an increase in the upthrust pushing up, keeping equilibrium. Do you ever feel like you had the weight of the world on your shoulders? Like, oh my gosh, boy, I, I have some burdens. I have some trials. With every, every pound of, of that force down that the, the devil and the evil one is, is pushing on us, 
that that circumstance is pushing on us, that doctor's report is pushing on us, that our, our job status is pushing down on us. God's Holy Spirit is pushing up. I got you. You're not going anywhere. I'm going to keep you afloat. I'll give you equilibrium. So for all the world to be put on your shoulders, I'll give equivalent pressure upwards and keep you afloat. Praise be to God. The gift of His Holy Spirit. When Jesus ascended into heaven, His disciples were, oh, don't leave, don't leave. No, I, I, I have to leave to make way for the Comforter. That is God's promise fulfilled in us that He saved us through His Son and now maintains us through His Spirit. May we celebrate that today to drink in and, and to receive and to acknowledge anew that, dear God, in my life today, it is your Holy Spirit that keeps me afloat. And I'm going to stop thinking that my burdens are greater or, or stronger pushing down than what your spiritual upthrust is pushing up. Please join me as we go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Gracious and loving Heavenly Father, thank you, dear God. Thank you, thank you, thank you, dear God, for this day and for the, all the opportunity that it brings. And Father, we just give you praise and glory this day. I praise you and I thank you for this opportunity that you have for us to gather together as a family. And you say where two or more are gathered, there you will be, and we know that, dear God. And you demonstrate that in each of our individual lives through the presence of your Holy Spirit. And Father God, we now acknowledge you in this hour. And Father God, I pray that we can acknowledge you in every situation of our life. We have a tendency, like Adam and Eve, when they had sinned to try to hide from you. <laughs> How foolish. Father, we don't want hidden sin in our life. We confess it to you in this hour. Dear God, never again. Do we want to have a, a separate place, a holy of holies, where we can come and worship you and then separated by real life, w where we actually are most of the time? But dear God, we just give you all of the praise and the glory. You tell us in Psalms to be still and not just know you as God, but to acknowledge you as God. And dear God, this day, this hour, we commit to you that we are going to acknowledge you in every step of our life. Every waking moment, every sleeping moment, every hour, we are going to acknowledge you as God. We're going to acknowledge you in those ugly, dirty situations where we're gleaning food from the pigs that we're feeding. We're going to acknowledge you, dear God, when the, the burdens of life seem overwhelming. We're going to acknowledge you, dear God, at the mountaintop experience of transfiguration where we see you in all of your glory, and we're going to acknowledge you, dear God, in every situation in our life, in between. Thank you, Father. And Father, while eyes are closed and heads are bowed, if any of my brothers or sisters this day wish to publicly acknowledge you as God, right where you're seated, just raise your hand. Just acknowledge him as God. Dear, dear Heavenly Father, I apologize that I, 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 I live on my own. I, I battle alone. I, I take on these circumstances on my own. And, and, I, and I believe the lie of the devil that I'm not worthy of your forgiveness. I'm not worthy of your blessing. I'm not worthy of your favor. I'm not worthy of your protection. It's a lie. And dear God, today I acknowledge you. And I acknowledge your word. I acknowledge your promise that I am worthy now. Thank you, dear God. Thank you, dear God. We pray your blessing upon this congregation. We pray your blessing, dear God, upon the shepherds, Chuck and Cheryl. We just pray that you would undergird them, undergird their family, dear God. May they know but know but know that you are God. And may that spiritual upthrust be greater than any time in their lives before. Thank you, Father. Continue to bless us this day, and as we go out through those doors from this sanctuary, may your light shine in us like the noonday sun. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' precious name we pray, and all of God's people say, amen.
Tom a, a, a hand for taking the time to come here. Would you stand for the benediction, please? Sovereign Lord, it does no good for us to hear your word, to hear it expounded, and then to leave this place and not take it out into the world. Our prayer is that your Holy Spirit would come into each of us, remind us that our job is not to just to walk around, but to walk around reflecting you. And we ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.